Hi, I'm Larry Castle here with Ken Brown for That's a Good Question, episode 33, Who Was at the Capitol Riot? Pastor Ken, this episode concludes our three-part series dealing with the issues that have surfaced in the political arena recently. Our desire is to help Christians analyze what undergirds our positions and test them for whether they correspond to biblical principles or not. So two weeks ago, we asked the question, why did the Capitol riots happen? And we answered that. Too many people, including Christian people, have opened themselves to false information that in turn caused some to respond in the way that we saw. And they did this based on false information about the election and especially what could be done about it on January 6th by the Congress and especially the vice president. Last week, we followed that up by looking at what many cite as the root of their belief that there are forces attempting to take our government from us. We noted that in the several controversies that have involved our now former president, the impeachment last year, for example, uh, the supposed stealing of the election, and now a second impeachment. In all of them, there are those who tie it back to the very beginning, as you explained, of his campaign and his presidency. And that's the Russia collusion story. We spent a good amount of time talking about that last time. All the other issues they view are simply extensions of the same attempt to get the president on trumped up charges. And I, that was an intended pun there. <laughs> So last week, we asked, is the deep state out to get Donald Trump? And we looked at the Russia matter in great detail in order to hopefully uh, cause some who see that uh, this common narrative uh, as being persuasive, that it's misleading. Hmm. Today, we want to finish the series with the question, who was at the Capitol riot? And our hope is that we can identify some additional threads that, li that led us to what we saw a couple weeks ago. And again, how that may have influenced Christian people. Pastor Ken, before we look at the question, who was at the Capitol riot, we want to once more make sure that our viewers understand why this matters to us as Christians and why it's important to our mission. Well, we have stressed several times in these episodes that we're not discussing these political issues, or really any issue that we discuss, for that matter, in a vacuum that's unrelated to our calling as, as pastors. We're looking at these because we've noticed a disturbing pattern in the thinking of many good Christian people, a, a susceptibility to accept as true claims that are not proven, and then to become worried and even fearful as a result of that. Now, I became alarmed this past year when I was hearing folks talk in terms of a coming civil war mm. and that we're in a battle for the soul of America and that this election, election is our last chance to get it right. Mm. I followed the election as closely as the next guy and more closely really than most, and I didn't have that same level of concern, and I wondered where this fear was being generated. And I've become convinced that it's our choices for information sources. I don't have the angry voice on the radio sometimes all day that people have telling me all the horrible things that the left or the deep state are up to. I don't have the, the talking head on television or uh, right-wing websites and social media telling me that same thing or, or even much worse. So it was our hope that showing what was at root of the narrative about the deep state is, is actually misleading. It was our hope that that would give our viewers pause about the news sources that have fed them that deceptive narrative, and then that they would consider shutting those down. You know, as Christians, we don't need the government to do by censorship what we as Christians should do by discernment regularly, to shut out and shut down the angry and misleading voices. So what happened over the last several years for many with whom I've corresponded is that they came to believe the deep state take down Donald Trump narrative so that all alleged wrongdoing then by the president was now seen through that lens. And once you have put on those lenses, 
you not only see everything through them, you also see the president himself differently. Now, when he talks about, as he did incessantly, as we know, during his presidency, fake news, you know it's true that it's fake news because they are using all of their mm -hmm. arsenal to harm him. And then in turn, those who support him, hmm. which then gets us to the election, that Trump as victim narrative includes that they will try to steal the election. In fact, the president predicted that they would. Yeah, I, I was just going to interject in there that, um, you know, it's not that and we've never said on any of these episodes that there's there is not. In fact, that's what we're saying. Uh, we've never said that there's not any such thing as fake news or, or news uh, yeah. networks never spin things to pro you know to benefit their own perspective. <laughs> We're right, in fact right. saying they do do that, but so do the ones we favor, right? Yeah. So that's exactly. why we've got to be it, discerning. It, it, you just got to be discerning. Don't let anybody just label it for you and then therefore rule it out. Mm -hmm. And and that's what happens. You know, anything that is negative toward our guy is not fake news. And anything that is presented by some other news outlet that may not be part of our right wing constellation is not wrong simply by virtue of where it came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we so can, we can addition, censor, we can, that's what you're just to reiterate what you're saying there. We can uh, censor ourselves. Uh, right. We can filter out the fake news, but we need to be sure we're doing it wherever it comes from. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Now you add to that, the, this idea that I heard from a number of people that the president predicted, in fact, that the election would, would be stolen. He said months before the election that it was rigged and that it's going to be stolen. And so the idea was, how could he know that? And then lo and behold, they did the very thing that, that he predicted. Mm -hmm. So the idea is it's all of a piece. And once you see the big picture, all of the dots then begin to connect. Here's, here's the problem with that, friends. The prediction that the election was going to be rigged and then stolen is not as impressive as it seems when you realize this, that Donald Trump has been in only three elections in his entire political life, which, as we know, he was not a politician prior to running for president. So his political life began really uh, in earnest five, five years ago. So he was involved in three elections. He was involved in the 2016 primaries because he had to run against, at the time, I think it was 16 or 17 others trying to get the Republican nomination during the primaries. Then, uh, having secured the nomination, he had to run against Hillary Clinton in the general election in 2016. And then in 2020, he ran in the general election. There were no primaries because he had no Republican uh, run against him. So get this now. He's run in three elections. He claimed a rigged election in all three of them. In 2016, he lost the very first of the primaries, actually called the caucuses in Iowa. He lost those to, to Ted Cruz. And he said this via tweet, of course. He said, Ted Cruz didn't win Iowa. He stole it. Based on fraud committed by Senator Ted Cruz during the Iowa caucus, either a new election should take place or Cruz results should be nullified. Now, does that sound familiar? in terms of what we've been hearing with regard to the 2020 election. Now, mind you, this is the very first election of, of Donald Trump's life. You, were you going to say? Uh, I was Larry? just going to say it does sound familiar because that's what my kids used to say when they lost at Monopoly or something. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you never lose. You know, you never lose. It's just, you know, somehow you were jobbed or, you know, and it was taken. I don't or mean like to make, that. I don't mean to make light if, if there was some sort of fraud, I don't mean to make light sure. of that either. If there were, we want to, we want it to be revealed. So, sorry, I, I don't want to make light of that unnecessarily. <laughs> but this is the very first election of, of his life, the very first contest in the, the primary season. And he's makes these claims, uh, uh, and he'll make those same claims then in others. In the general election in 2016 against Hillary Clinton, he repeatedly said that it's rigged and it's going to be stolen. He was down in the polls. We may remember this. No one expected him to win. But he had an, an, ex an explanation already at hand for when he, as everybody anticipated, I think including himself, that he actually lost. And it was in effect this. I didn't lose. They stole it. Hmm. Losing is for losers. I'm not a loser. In fact, I never lose. 
If I happen to lose, it's just because I was I was robbed. And then when he won the Electoral College in 2016, to everyone's surprise, but he lost the popular vote, he couldn't even let that loss stand. And so he claimed that the popular vote was stolen with dead people voting for Hillary and all manner of corruption. He, in fact, after he became president, established a commission to look into that. Guess what they found? As, as you might have guessed. They didn't find any, any <laughs> corruption, yeah. Nothing to come close to overturning the three million votes by which he lost the, the popular vote. And then again, this past year, down in the polls for the entirety of the campaign, he said the same things over and over and over again. So he didn't really predict anything. It wasn't true in the 2016 primaries. It wasn't true in the 2016 election. And it wasn't true in this election, as every court that heard the the evidence said that that evidence did not amount to proof of any such of any such thing. So we're hoping that those who believe those stories will then reevaluate the reliability of those who told those stories to you and that you'll shut off and and shut those down. Down. Friends, our minds are not to be open to disinformation. A mind, it said, is a terrible thing to waste, the United Negro College Fund's motto. A Christian mind is a horrible thing to waste. Given that it's given to us by God, it's being renewed by God, and we're to think like him, and we're to take every thought captive rather than allowing our thoughts to be captured by people who are have something uh, to gain from, from that. And so our minds are to be treated very, uh, are to be treated in a way that is very precious and to be guarded very closely. Yeah, I, I encourage you at home who are listening to this, do consider uh, how you engage in responsible censorship of the information you take in. Mm -hmm. Carefully choose your sources. I had somebody comment on something that I had shared our last episode. Uh, just mm. just this week, uh, citing something from back in November, early November. Um, actually, I think it might have been early December uh, about voter fraud and here's proof. And it, all it took was a few minutes on the Internet. I was able to look up the court decision, 35 page detailed decision, and mm. uh, very easily see that the, the claim the source was making wasn't true. And yet that mm. was still being repeated to this day. So shut yeah. down those who, as Pastor Ken said, shut down those who've misled you um, because responsible censorship of what we take in is part of biblical discernment. And we want that for all of our viewers. So uh, the, the lenses that folks adopt and in turn the way they see the world, uh, that contributed to getting people to the Capitol. And that was part of what resulted in the riot then. So let, let's talk about that now. Who was at the Capitol riot? Well, to state the obvious, literally no one knows every person or perhaps even most persons who were there. As, uh, as far as I know, there was not a central registration for that event. It was, though, not as spontaneous as uh, it may have seemed because the president and others had been asking his supporters to show up on that day under, again, the false pretense that the election could be overturned by the Congress or the uh, the vice president. Some Trump supporters organized groups to come in buses. But beyond that, I know of no central registration that would identify who was there in any kind of detail. Of the tens of thousands who attended the rally, perhaps hundreds went into the Capitol and a hundred or uh, went to the Capitol, I should say, and then a hundred or maybe 200 actually entered the Capitol building. At this point, over a hundred have already been arrested. And it's clear, just as kind of an aside, that this was not a false flag operation <laughs> by Antifa or other left-wing groups that started floating around immediately on right-wing media. Uh, there were supporters of the, these were supporters of the president who believed that the government uh, and was being stolen from them. Can, it, can I ask those, about that phrase you used, the yeah. false flag uh, operation? Yeah. Is I've heard yeah. that, but only from sources like QAnon and that kind of, some of the really wild uh, 
uh, yeah. conspiracy sources. Is am I am I wrongly associating it with that, or is that a more common? No, term? that's normally who that's normally who says it. But you know, the, honestly, those kinds of things are becoming more mainstreamed hmm. in uh, in you know in in the case of QAnon in right wing radio, uh, right wing hmm. media sources. Left wing has its own, of course, but I don't yeah. care about the left wing because we're not left wing, as I keep right. saying. So, right. uh, but the false flag idea is that uh, you make it look like it's your enemy, right. and so you actually inspire the thing. You're actually it's your people there, but you are taking on their persona, and so that they'll be blamed for this 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 bad event. And mm -hmm. so immediately that was that was what happened. But there was you know the for example, the guy in the um, the guy in the horns and the yeah. Viking outfit that was so there, there were pictures that surfaced of that guy previously. Uh, I think back in the summer at like a B black lives matter rally. Yeah. And yeah, so was, that was proof that. that this guy, look, that guy's not really a Trump supporter. He's really a black lives matter guy. Well, he was at those things, but he was at those things in opposition <laughs> to black lives matter. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it was what it appeared to be uh, un unfortunately. Uh, and what those who stormed the Capitol did really was logical if you accept these two false premises. Can I add one more question did. to that? Um, yeah, yeah. I did have somebody ask me about, there was somebody, uh, I forget the yeah. person's name, yeah. who was yeah, a Black Lives too. Matter activist. But, uh, well, was it Black Lives Matter or was it Antifa? Uh, I can't remember. I, well, yeah, whatever. Right. Uh, but but I know who you're someone talking. who is doing that, but it's a single person. But I, I had somebody right. respond to me uh, in a discussion about that as if, see, yeah. but that, that's one person out of thousands, right? Well, the exception proves the rule, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, if you exactly if you find if you've had 100 and some people arrested, uh, they're all Trump supporters and they're all and you get one guy who is there trying to do well, OK, that he obviously isn't the cause of anything that happened there. So well, if, he, there if, he, two, if he was the cause, that just but, goes to prove that we're too easily led astray. Uh, that's true, too. Seriously. Boy, that guy's good. He's good. Yeah. <laughs> Let 100 so conservatives into battle. Yeah. Yes. There, so there are these two false premises, and everybody who went into the Capitol believed these. One, the election mm -hmm. was stolen. Two, that Congress or the vice president could stop the steal if they were willing to, to do it. And the, the president had claimed both. If, if both of those were true, then really, how can a true patriot stand back and allow this to happen in America? I mean, as I think about it, if I thought both of those were true, and I was of a revolutionary mindset, I'll talk about the revolutionary mindset in a bit, but if I were of that mindset, I might storm the Capitol my, myself if that were I, happening. I, would, uh, I don't think I'm alone when I say I would pay real money to see you in that bullhorns and the viking <laughs> outfit but what you're saying makes what you're saying makes total sense um you know i could see why a lot of people who didn't intend didn't go there intending to storm the capitol would be there to put pressure on the lawmakers they thought could do something and then i could also yep. see why those uh who had intended to do you know they were up to no good could convince mm -hmm. the rest of them to go in when they see them doing nothing in their minds yeah. about it yeah you know, what did you have here? You had mostly people who came to protest peacefully, mm -hmm. uh, but some of those and not even most of those, not even close to most of those, from what I can tell. But some of those who didn't intend to do that actually ended up doing it because they got swept up in it. Mm -hmm. But then you got the people who did intend to do it. Yeah. But but as proof that there were some who <laughs> were willing to fight this thing because of what they've been told over weeks and weeks to the very bitter end. Consider this. You know who the my pillow guy is? His name's mm -hmm. Mike Lindell, and he's done these uh, commercials over and over again for My Pillow. I actually have My Pillow, so it's pretty good. <laughs> so we we bought some of those. Uh, I don't know, some did, time did ago. Did you have to? Did you have to learn a secret handshake and sign up to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> when we bought, I I had no idea until just a few months ago, really, that he was so involved in in all of this mm -hmm. kind of that kind of very conspiratorial stuff. I had no idea. I wouldn't have bought on my pillow, just to be perfectly frank. I mean, perfectly honest, I would not have, and I'm not going to again, <laughs> because of the wackiness that he's involved in. And not just wackiness, dangerous stuff. I mean, here, mm -hmm. here he was just this last Friday. This is six days before Biden's inauguration. It's after the riot at the Capitol. 
He's at the White House. And what's he there to talk about? He's there to talk about implementing martial law and invoking the Insurrection Act. Now, how do we know that? Because he was standing outside the White House waiting to be admitted in, and an enterprising photographer actually zoomed in on the notes that he had in his hand. Hmm. And you can find those notes out on the Internet, and you zoom in on them, and he's talking about, you look at them, and he's talking about his suggestion for what we can do to over the next five, six days, still mm. make sure that Donald Trump remains the president. Insurrection Act, martial law, all of that. Anyway, I mentioned earlier the revolutionary mentality. I'd like to spend some time on that uh, because part of the group uh, that went to the Capitol fit into, into that category. While we don't know the exact composition of the thousands of people who showed up on January the 6th, I think it is safe to say that you have at least two groups, one of them much larger than the other. The first, the largest group, are just as we said. They're peaceful protesters, misled protesters, but still peaceful. Perhaps angry, perhaps loudly angry, but not violent and with no intentions of, of being violent. It's unfortunate that they had been misled to think that the Electoral College results could be overturned by what was happening that day. And we've tried to deal with why they thought that and why they uh, thought they had a need to be there uh, to try to make something happen that just wasn't going to happen. And uh, we're just encouraged, encouraging our people yet again, shut out those voices who, who mislead. But if that's all it was then there would have been no riot, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But there yeah, were I, speakers. Did I, did I share riot. with you, I had seen, sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, I had right. shared with you, I think, a video of a gentleman who fits exactly into that category. And uh, it mm -hmm. was sad to hear him describe. And you could see him questioning himself all along the way as he described what happened. And, and he described being there and kind of getting caught up in the moment and then finding himself inside mm -hmm. and being like, yeah, this is right, right? And then he kind of pauses. He's like, yeah. I think it was right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, one of the ways uh, that he got caught, guys like him got caught up in that is because, in fact, at the rally, there were speakers whose language was at best unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Language that can move an angry group to something more than they actually came for. I mean, here you have you know, Rudy Giuliani saying, quote, let's have trial by combat. I you have Donald Trump thinking Jr. when he saying, said that. Exactly. You have Donald Trump Jr. saying, we're coming for you, and it won't be pleasant. You have Congressman Mo Brooks from Alabama saying, it's time to take names and kick. You You can fill in the blank. Uh, you have the president saying, we need to, I said this last week, so I'll say it again, we need to fight like hell. You'll never take our country back with weakness. You have to fight. Now, I have to put in the obligatory. He did have the one line. Uh, as far as I know, it was one time during the entire speech, but he did say, uh, go peacefully, uh, something to, to that effect. But it's within all of this blizzard of things that you're getting from other people and then some of the things he said himself. So whether those are legally words of incitement, I, I cannot say. I can see how they could take an already angry group and mm -hmm. then put them over the edge and then they end up trespassing in, in the Capitol. In fact, some who have been interviewed fit that that very category. Like you said, you you saw one of them, and I remember you sending that to me. But then there's this other group, the revolutionary mindset group. They're smaller, but they're more dangerous, and they're ready to be violent. Mm -hmm. In fact, for them, the willingness to be violent is patriotic. Yeah, so, so uh, some of those who stormed the Capitol were people who believed that what you're saying here is they actually believe that violence against the government is our duty. That sometimes is my patriotic duty. Uh, I, I'm supposed to, you know, in order to stop the stealing by the states and the cooperation of the Congress, I should mm -hmm. take up arms and be violent. Um, I, I've i actually had somebody tell me that there's a rebellion clause in the Constitution. That's, this makes me think mm. of that. But mm. uh, I had asked you about it, and we, we talked a little bit about it. And I have I carry a, a copy of the Constitution on my phone uh, for other things oh, in the are. past that I've 
I've, <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you, more you and I were talk- you're more of a geek than I thought in a lot of ways that I didn't know. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, you're the political <laughs> geek. I'm the, I'm the technology <laughs> geek. We merged together in the, in the app for the constitution, but there is one and, and you've pointed out to me before. It's not a very long document and I've looked through it. Yeah. There's no revolution. There's no rebellion clause. Um, right. But there are those who believe that our Constitution, when when you look at it along with like the Declaration of Independence, I think that's where this is coming from, assumes mm. that we have the right to rebel when the government becomes too uh, too uh, totalitarian and tramples on our rights. I don't. I've mm. looked though. I don't see that. In fact, I think that the structure of our government is laid out in our founding documents intentionally to make that an unnecessary consideration. But that's not even what we're concerned about here, right? We're concerned with right. what Christian people believe and do. Exactly. And, and that right. means that we're concerned with what God's word says about rebellion against the government, right? So exactly. as I as I think about that then, uh, what does God's word say on this subject? I can think of maybe one verse that tells, uh, that talks about uh, in relationship to governing authorities in Acts chapter five, we're told we will obey God rather than man. But this was in direct um, application of being told not to preach the gospel. That's a command we're given directly by God. We we cannot disobey God in order to obey that command. But outside of that, if you look at how the Bible presents government, even a bad government, it's presented as a gift from God, right? That's why, that's why they had in the... Um, <clears throat> first century in the Roman Empire, where the early church is set, some of its leaders like Nero, yet the Bible presents even that government as being from God. It's God's gracious gift. In fact, Romans uh, 13, 1 and 2 says that the authorities that exist have been established by God, and consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I mean, that's a it's a pretty serious yeah. warning. And the government right. was not a good government over yeah. the people that were being told that at the time. Uh, right. The Bible says in that same passage to submit to the governing authorities. And in one of the uh, few other passages that speak of government, uh, we're told, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And then it goes on to say whether the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. And I've had some folks mm-hmm. say, well, see, that that's talking about only a good government. But when you look at all of those together, it's clearly saying the government is a gift from God for good right. purposes, and we are to submit to them. So uh, what do Christian people do with that? And and apparently many of those who are at the Capitol, professing Christians, carrying Jesus 2020 signs, yeah. spending time in prayer in the chamber Senate right after all the vulgarity that came out of their mouth, uh, not very convincing, yeah. but uh, what, right. what do we do with that? How, how do they explain that? You know, as we know, Christians living in a fallen world, we constantly have the, the challenge of resisting the spirit of the age. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an ever-present danger. That's why Scripture warns us against being conformed to this world and tells us we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But there is a school of thought in the world out there that sees the government not as a gift and a, and a blessing, but as an evil to be feared. And some Christians have adopted it. And they plan and they even talk about the day when they're going to have to take on the the government. Some of you in the Detroit area here, I know we have viewers uh, from outside our area, but some of you in the Detroit, Michigan area may remember a guy on the radio many years ago, local, named Mark Scott. Mark Scott. Mm -hmm. Mark Scott. Uh, regularly had people on who were of this of this mindset, and he would talk uh, quite a bit about what the government was doing and how the government was to be feared and how we needed to prepare for it. Had people on who who believed all of that, and he would start his program with the voice of a child, and the child would say this: "I love my country, but I fear my government." And, you know, the the child was important because he was communicating. We've got to teach our kids to fear the government. And so that's what a lot of Christians have done, I think, is not maybe not a lot, but many 
uh, they've adopted this idea from the world that the government's not a gift, it's not a blessing, it's something to be feared. Yeah, that um, you know, in that, the idea you were saying earlier about um, being ready to fight, I mean, isn't that the same mistake that some of the disciples initially made when Jesus came on the scene? It mm -hmm. seems like we mm -hmm. would be able to learn from that. But, mm -hmm. I, you mm -hmm. know, the Bible doesn't really tell us to fear government, right? In, in fact, in First Peter, um, it does mention fear and government in the same verse, but it says, uh, fear God and honor the emperor. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, maybe someone could say in the Romans passage that I referred to that, um, you know, the government bears the sword, doesn't bear the sword for nothing that we should fear, but only if we're doing evil is the yeah. point there, right? Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, it's really hard to find in the Bible the idea uh, that we're supposed to fear the government. I don't I don't know where you find it. And as I mentioned, you, you have the Mark Scott types who are regularly talking about the government and what the government's up to and especially how they want to especially how they want to take our guns mm -hmm. so that eventually they, the government, can become our masters. There's a lot, a lot, a whole lot of talk on social media about how the liberals are all about taking control and we need to be ever vigilant to signs that they are, in fact, starting to do that. You know, it's it's interesting that uh, when you have discussions, I, you know, as you know, I have discussions on Twitter sometimes mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> When you talk about this, it's interesting to see how um, the discussion goes from two Christians. We're talking about what does God's word say, and when it when it gets to this point, we're no longer quoting scripture. We're, the person begins to like quote Thomas Paine, and you know mm. you're quoting American revolutionaries, and that's that's yeah. the point I was trying to make earlier. Is that that's okay? That it's not irrelevant what's happened before, but that's not our standard, right? As, as Christians, yeah, if that's what we want to do is take a Christian approach, then yeah, absolutely. And yet you have lots of Christians who are regularly talking about this kind of thing, preparing for when the government is going to come after us. So, so look out for every possible sign that what they are planning to do, and in the minds of many, what they are planning to do and what they've been planning to do for a very long time, the government to take over. Let's look for the signs that they're really uh, starting to do that. So this fear of government as an enemy to be watched with a, a wary eye explains why some have what seems to be, have you ever noticed this if you, as you're dealing with folks who are just reading what they say maybe on social media or hearing them talk, that they have a sort of hair trigger that yeah. angers them whenever the government does something to others that, that to others of us just seems like you know, pretty benign. I mean, here's one recent example that we've all had to deal with, and, and that is masks, the wearing of masks. Now, I'm not talking here about the efficacy of masks. I'm not talking about the wisdom of wearing masks. I'm not talking about uh, whether or not the rules put in place are proper, whether they're balanced. I'm not talking about any of that. Okay, we, we can disagree about the effectiveness. We can disagree about the extent of the rules. But it never occurs to me to see mass as part of this larger plot by the government that's all about control. Hmm. And yet, for some people, that's the deal. In fact, I have read people, I have read Christian people saying this is all about control. I wrote a blog a few months ago and, uh, in which I mentioned something called the clergy response teams that the Federal Emergency Management Administration had and that these folks who believe this with the revolutionary mindset, they took these clergy response teams training uh, <coughs> clergy to be counselors in the event of a national emergency or a widespread emergency in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, they took that to mean preparation for martial law. They're enlisting pastors to be involved in martial law. Now, how do you get from one to the other? Well, the way you do that, how you get from training to help in a crisis to enlisting pastors to be part of martial law, the way you get there is because you have this view of government as, hmm. as evil and something to be very wary of. So, so you have people that think about it and talk about it a lot what the government is plotting and how uh, if you're a patriot you can thwart it so when you have it on the brain and mm -hmm. it's you know it's no surprise then that 
uh, you see in what otherwise would be innocuous things, this mentality. So, for example, Mm -hmm. vaccines, you know, there's some evil plot of what they're going to do by coming up with a vaccine unless it's the former president. Then it's a good thing. Uh, You you mentioned masks as an example. Um, Any regulations, really, which which is kind of silly because uh, we make you know, we we notice the inconsistency in that when someone on an opposing view says, you know, you can't tell me what to do with my body, for example, uh, in mm. the pro-life, uh, mm. pro-choice debate. Mm. And we're like, well, every law is telling you what to do with your body. We recognize that the government makes laws. That's what it does. But yes, here we're exactly. you know, we're taking innocuous things like you say and making a huge deal of them. And that's because you're looking for something. That's yeah. because your your mind is set on that. You have it on the brain, as, as you said. And honestly, it's especially with regard to regulations about guns. Mm-hmm. Now, I may get shot for wading into this. Not funny. <laughs> but there is. <laughs> no, OK, sorry. But uh, there is a mindset that sees gun ownership as necessary to thwart government overreach. And this is the nexus between peaceful protests and a willingness to be violent if you think the government has gone too far. So uh, this is we're not saying that or I guess I should say I I understand the uh, interest in having gun ownership, for example, as being kind of a top level item. It is called out in our Constitution, but we're we're not talking about that. You're saying seeing that as actually uh, uh, the rationale behind it so that you can go to war with your own government, right? Um, right, right. So Yeah, it, so the idea oh, is, can you go to war with, you know, we've got to have, we've got to have our own set of weapons in order to keep them from taking over because the government is set on tyranny. And yeah. so that we're going to have to use these guns. And so therefore any regulation on guns and on, a, on an arsenal uh, or a personal arsenal that we might have, you know, the problem with that is as a number of pointed out though, is that, you know, the government has larger, is always going to have larger weapons. <laughs> I was just going to, okay. I was just going to ask you that you, I, I've found yeah. that line of reasoning persuasive in the past. And as I've tried to think through it, in fact, in conversations with you, uh, I've been forced to ask, all right, so you've got, tanks and aircraft, aircraft carriers, right. missiles. So how's that work then? How are our guns going to exactly. help us against the federal government? So like you said, you know, many of us see the Second Amendment right, and it is that to keep and bear arms as a great thing to protect our, our families from intruders. And we have this as a God-given right. I, I'm convinced that scripture teaches this in the book of Exodus, uh, in the law, that you have a right to protect your family from from harm. And if that means that you have to harm the intruder, uh, even kill the intruder, uh, if that's necessary, so be it. And uh, likewise, in the New Testament, Jesus, in the, the book of Luke, he tells his, uh, his apostles, he says, I want you to go out and I want you to get ready to go on your travels. And he says, take a sword with you. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, well, that was for their that was for their protection. So we have this right God given, not just in the Constitution, but I'm very glad that it's enshrined in the Constitution, and it allows for ownership of guns for protection. You know, I think of things like those who are hunters. You know, that's mm-hmm. what I think of when I, I think of the Second Amendment. But others see it as a protection against government tyranny, and that's partly why any regulation of guns is vehemently opposed by those with the revolutionary mentality. Again, I'm not here to make a policy statement about what guns should be allowed, what restrictions, if any, all of that. I'm not saying that. I, I'm simply saying that it doesn't have the same kind of effect on me because I don't have the revolutionary mentality because I'm thinking of guns the way I just said, as protection for my family, as you know, for hunting. But you have lots of people who are preparing for what they see as a coming conflict with the government, and they're looking mm-hmm. for signs that that time is here and they're talking to one another about it and talking to one another about it now more than ever because they have the vehicle to do that through social media. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they may actually inadvertently bring the very thing that they're Mm -hmm. talking about and preparing for, they may bring it about. I mean, think about it. If you're predicting martial law and then your obsession with it leads you to do things that trigger a massive government response, it then proves your suspicions were right in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the progression is this. You have the, the revolutionary mindset. 
you see every intrusion by the government as taking away freedoms. So you go on a protest in on January the, the 6th, you, some storm the, the Capitol. And the result of that is we now have 25,000 troops in Washington, D.C. to protect for the inauguration. And you have D.C. for blocks and blocks as completely shut down. And the reaction is that I've actually read from some people mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Look, they're using as an excuse to show their power and put martial law in the nation's capital. I just well, don't understand. How could it be that complicated to realize <laughs> after what happened, why that would be the <laughs> reasonable response? Yeah, exactly. So th this is this is a uh, you know this is kind of a mindset that is foreign to you and I. You know, we like you were saying, we're thankful for the God-given right to protect our families. We're also thankful for the God-given gift of government, but we don't look at the government as our enemy and our need to be ready to go to war against it. So that, you know, it makes me probably uh, more likely to underestimate whether or not this is something that's widespread among Christians. Do you, do you think it is? Yeah, yeah. numbers, uh, how widespread, all of that, you know, of course, I, I don't know. Uh, but we did see at the protests, and then we did see from those who were going in, a number of people carrying Bibles, you know, the Jesus 2020 uh, uh, Christian flags out there, you know, that kind of thing. And it is the case that many militia groups uh, have a lot of Christian flavor to them. Hmm. Oh, so what's the, what's the connection? It's a good way to say it, uh, Christian I, flavor. It's a good way to say yeah. it. Yeah, you know, overtones and, you know, language and that kind of thing, symbols. Uh, but evangelicals, have for historical reasons that we know about have had an independent streak. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had to fight for separation of church and state. Uh, we revolted against the dominant church power, which had also become a secular power in the reformation. Uh, we put in place something that the Bible teaches, but had unfortunately long been lost called the priesthood of the believer and things like individual soul liberty. And so there is an independence. There's an independence uh, to our, our very kinds of churches. And then for those in our churches, there is a, a freedom and individualism that is, is a blessing from God as a priest, as the priesthood of the believer, that kind of thing, if it's understood in the overall scriptural context. I mean, just it's interesting to me, at least, that the Michigan militia, you may remember in the 90s, the Michigan militia became a really big deal. It became mm -hmm. a big deal because the infamous uh, terrorist, Timothy McVeigh, uh, had connections to Michigan. Mm -hmm. And to uh, his main co-conspirator, a guy named Terry Nichols, had trained with the Michigan militia. And so uh, Michigan, for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, that Michigan, uh, like places like Idaho and Wyoming, but why Michigan, I'm not sure. But we've been kind of a hotbed for this kind of thing for a number of, of decades. The, the leader of the Michigan militia was a guy named Norm Olson. And Norm Olson was also a Baptist preacher hmm. uh, as, as well. You, and you, you find that kind of thing. Yes. I was going to say, uh, this kind of came up in conversation about this series at some point. I don't remember what the context was that, uh, maybe it was about the Second Amendment and um, Michigan militia. That's an interesting name because, you know, and I think it's a reference back to that. But you and I were talking that uh, w the Michigan to, to a well-ordered mil militia being maintained by our state, uh, that's not some independent agency like this is. It's like the Michigan National Guard, right? Well, I will say uh, I, I will say that I won't I won't pontificate on that because back in 2008 there was a supreme court case called uh, the heller case uh in which the supreme court finally spoke on the issue of do you have an individual right to gun ownership <laughs> and i 2008 2008 wow wow that they hadn't spoken on that they hadn't directly spoken on that is amazing but they did and the majority opinion was written by 
the late Antonin Scalia. And Scalia did his best as an originalist to try to put those phrases in an original context. But it was it was very difficult for him to do. I've read that decision. It was very difficult for him to do. And the uh, dissenting opinion was written by John Paul Stevens, now retired liberal guy, but nonetheless, he wrote, and he did the same kind of thing. He looked up, what do those phrases mean? What did they mean at the time? What was the import of them? And it is, the Second Amendment is a notoriously difficult thing to interpret. Mm -hmm. What does a well-regulated militia being necessary to a, the maintenance of a free people? Yeah. What, what does that mean? You know, it, it's, it's hard to tell. And, but it does also have the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be abridged or infringed. And so uh, it does have that phrase. And so I have no quibble at all with those who then say the, the Constitution says very directly, we have a right to keep and bear arms and it shall not be you know, infringed. OK, mm -hmm. you know, fair enough. Uh, I just don't also, though, take that to mean that uh, that any regulation uh, on on what arms someone has or where they can take them or any of that. I personally don't take it that way, but, but many do. They have a problem with, with any of that. Part of that, I'm not saying everybody, obviously I can't speak for everybody, but part of the reason that people do react as strongly as they do to that is because we have to have these arms because we are, we should fear the government. We should fear mm -hmm. government, government tyranny. This was a really big deal with the Oklahoma city, uh, 95 bombing. And I bring it up uh, for this reason. Look, I'm not trying to associate people uh, that just feel strongly about these things. Uh, and, and that that means they're going to become like Timothy McVeigh. Uh, mm. You know, obviously there's only one Timothy McVeigh, thank, thankfully, and hopefully there won't be another. Uh, but I am just trying to show where the mentality comes from, though, and why people do feel as strongly as they do. Uh, Oklahoma City, the blowing up of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City in night was in 1995. But what that was precipitated by was a, a couple of big events. 1992 in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. Ruby Ridge, Idaho. Uh, there was a guy named Randy Weaver with his family. He's living back in the sticks in Idaho. And apparently he had a, a, a number of guns. He had, you know, and whether they were all registered, I don't. I, I think the answer was no. I think that's why the government was moving in. Uh, but even gun regis registration is a big deal uh, to those who have this because that's a first step toward the government, you know, having control. So anyway, uh, the government moved in and moved in with an unbelievably heavy hand, to put it mildly. I mean, they brought in helicopters and they brought in all kinds of stuff around this guy's shack, really, in the sticks in, in Idaho. I was telling you this story within the last couple of weeks. Uh, just such a sad story. Uh, he's in there. They're barricaded in there. They're surrounded by all these ATF agents and all of that. And his wife opens the door, mm. is holding their one-year-old child, and she is shot mm. dead right in the head. Wow. And, and, and they had to drag her. The family had to drag her body into the house, closed the door, and she was in there. She lay in there dead for several days after that. It was, a, it was really sick. It was, and it was really, and it was the government who did that. Hmm. Now, uh, you know, there was a whole investigation and there was discipline meted out and, and all of that as well there should have been. So that, you talk about overreach and, and you talk about now feeding into though, the idea, look what the government, you know, the government does. So that was 92. The next year is when you had Waco, Texas. And some of you will remember Waco mm -hmm. and the Branch Davidians and David Koresh. And, you know, the government goes in with having many multi-week siege uh, because he had these, you know, these guns and his compound there. And then they take these tanks and go into the building and the mm -hmm. building go, catches on fire. And then it's, you know, did the government de deliberately set it on fire? There are all kinds of conspiracies about that. My goodness. Well, you can see how the Michigan militia and how the Timothy McVeigh's and the Terry Nichols and all of that, they said, this is it, man. This is it. The government is coming after us. This is the time that we've been training for, and we need to send them a message. And that's exactly, that's exactly what he was doing with the Oklahoma City bombing. So this is why it takes much less to incite a group than we would think. 
because mm-hmm. some people are already some people are already jazzed. It's similar to this, you know, in our circles, in Christian circles, church circles. You have some people who talk a lot about end times stuff, and they're and they're mm-hmm. looking for signs of the end times all the time. You know, we just finished a series all last year through the book of Revelation. The Bible talks about the end times. Uh, I, I think I'm convinced primarily not for us to be looking for signs, but primarily for us to be comforted in the present <laughs> that everything that's happening is part of the plan. And it's all going according to God's plan. And it is going to end exactly the way God has said it's going to end. That's how we should look at it. But for Mm -hmm. some people, it's looking behind every bush and it's looking for every sign of the Antichrist and the satanic one world government. And so they're constantly on edge about it. Well, when you're constantly on edge about something, you've adopted those lenses. Now you see it in many more places than Mm -hmm. others would see. But the question Mm -hmm. is this, friends, we're going to close off here, but... Does the Bible teach that you should be in fear of government? And I've read it, and I don't, I don't find it. Okay, I don't find it. I find the, I find what Pastor Larry was reading about being a gift from God, even a bad government. I find all of that. So if you find yourself on edge about the government regularly, then I think I'm convinced that you've adopted a mindset that is contrary to what the Bible teaches about how we how we should view government. We should criticize government. Thank thank the Lord we, we have mm-hmm. the freedom to, to petition our government and to protest and all of that and disagree with our government and vote people in that we want and all of that. Man, what a great thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's do that and let's use those freedoms. But being on edge all the time and looking for and, and, and getting ready for the coming apocalypse with the government is not what the Bible teaches. So are we really on the verge in our country of totalitarianism, the way many would make you think and, and get you geeked about and scared about? I, I, how about this? <laughs> if you can read the list of grievances, 27 of them, that the founders uh, mm. wrote up about King George <laughs> in England and what he was doing to them, and of course, we know they revolted and they and they declared their independence. And we had a revolutionary war as a result of it. We know all of that. If, if you can look at those 27 and you can say to me, that's what's going on in America right now. Now, there are people who do that. And some of you watching me may be able to do that and go, yeah, I think at least half of them are happening right now. OK, we're just not looking through the same lenses and I don't know what to do with that. But I think mm-hmm. most of you. If you would go and read those, you can Google them, Twenty the, the grievances that are in the Declaration of Independence. People forget the Declaration of Independence, two-thirds of it is actually this list of grievances <laughs> against, this, against this King George. This is probably, probably opening a can of worms at the end of a 52-minute episode. <laughs> but uh, oh, wow. I, I just recall reading uh, from John MacArthur earlier in the year, uh, just I think you quoted it on your blog, actually, about did, uh, even did. even with that, that that yeah. was right. uh, an ungodly revolution. MacArthur has taught that for years and years. And, you know, he as he is wont to do, he's fidelity to Scripture and he does his level best like we try to do is to apply God's word to our current circumstances. And that's the, yeah. the position he has held consistently for many years. So, uh, yeah, there is that question. That's a live question. Here's I'll leave it with this, though. If you if if we had those 27 things going on right now, hmm. I'd at least be willing to have a conversation with you about a revolution. OK, yeah. gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> I'd at least be willing to consider, you know, OK, I see what you're saying. It has become so onerous. Mm-hmm. But the point is, we're not we're not even close to that. But with people who have a mentality that says I have to take a preemptive approach, a preemptive approach, I have to be ready way before it happens. And I can't give an inch because I know what tyrannical government does. It takes a mile. And so every time I see some kind of mandate, every time I see some kind of regulation, I have to react to it the way I have keeps people on edge all the time. So who was at the riot? That was our question. Peaceful Mm -hmm. protesters who had been misled. And then some revolutionaries who had been waiting uh, for what they see as the necessary occasion to revolt. And that's not going to stop. And so, Christian friend, just I am urging you not to be of that mentality, to fear the government and to, and to get caught up in that and to be looking for it all the time. It's not what the Lord has told us in Scripture to do. 
Thanks, Pastor Ken. So uh, thank you at home for sticking with us through these three episodes as we look at this yes, uh, sometimes tangly web of details and, and lots of nitty gritty details to try to think through mm -hmm. biblically how we should look at these circumstances, these current events. So thanks for sticking with us. Uh, just want to remind you, uh, I should do this at the beginning. I, best practice, I think, is to do this at the beginning because people just clicked quit. Uh, they know we're done, mm. <laughs> so they yeah, won't see it. True. But I just want to remind everybody, make sure you follow us on Facebook. And then also, if you're on YouTube watching us, make sure you click the subscribe button and even the little notification bell so you know when we produce new content. And I uh, just want to say thanks for watching today, and we'll see you in the next episode. If you have a question you'd like us to consider, you can send that into our email address, info at cbctrenton.com or text it to us at 97000.